It is our pleasure today and our honor to be able to welcome our friends from St. David's Episcopal Church here in Southfield. We're delighted that you're joining us. Thank you so much for being here. And it especially is an honor, joy, and a treat to be able to welcome my friend and my teacher, Father Chris Yaw, who will be offering our sermon this morning. Father Chris Yaw has now served for many years as leader of St. David's. Among many uh, initiatives that he has led them in is really a commitment to prayer, to study, and to performing incredible acts of loving kindness. Among those, of course, are a real dedication to feeding the hungry. And in addition, and now has made national headlines in their efforts to engage in a gun buyback initiative to really take the guns out of the hands of the bad guys and keep all of us safe. So we wish an incredible thank you and congratulations to Father Chris and to his church for all of their incredible efforts. If you Google Father Chris Yaw, you will find him all over the place. He is on radio, he's on television, he's engaged in all sorts of video teaching projects and really, I think, is a blessing to our people and our community. Among the reasons I say that is because of his incredible efforts in interfaith work. Father Chris has been now the longtime leader of our group here in Southfield, Lift Up Southfield, and has brought together Jews and Christians of all backgrounds in learning and in dialogue. And for that, I'm very grateful. And over the years of our hard work, I've had the real pleasure and honor to become his friend, to learn from him, to break bread with his family, and to uh, really just be able to enjoy his incredible company. So now it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome to our Bima, my friend, this synagogue's friend, Father Chris Yaw. Are you done, Rabbi? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You want me up here? Okay. I feel like I'm at Mission Control here in Cape Canaveral. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see you. Greetings to you. To my friends and to my friends to be, I would like to um, let you know that I'm really touched and humbled to be speaking with you today. Um, I want to certainly thank Rabbi Starr for extending the invitation. Um, and I'm sure you know what a gifted and remarkable leader he is, as well as very skilled and astute at introducing guest speakers. <laughs> so congregation leaders, uh, Rabbi Dalin and uh, Hazan uh, Propis and, um, and all my friends with whom we've shared ministry over the years, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, it's, it's really great to, uh, to stand at this dais and I am filled with great joy to be here among you today. Um, and I know beyond a doubt why Rabbi has invited me here this morning because I'm not that naive that Pope Benedict was not available. <laughs> His jet was in the shop and I live just down the street. But I do want to say, Rabbi, greetings to you one and all. Greetings to you, our big brother. Little brother has come for a visit. We know dad is happy to see us together in prayer and in fellowship, sharing a meal. And when I told my congregation that part of your hospitality included an open bar, <laughs> the signups doubled. <laughs> this morning, friends, we remember that 97% of our very essence, our DNA, we have in common, Christians and Jews. This we come to celebrate in this stunningly beautiful place. The 3% that sets us apart we discuss in the parking lot, which is why it's so big. But Rabbi Aaron, like me, I know you have people who come to visit. They walk into this amazing, historic, majestic, vital congregation space, and they walk into this sacred atmosphere, and they marvel at your stained glass, at your soaring, soaring ceiling, amazing use of wood and of color and of light, and they say, Rabbi, what a beautiful synagogue you have, to which the rabbi replies, yes, and the building's not bad either. <laughs> because you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, you are the synagogue, the people of Congregation Sherezetic, the holy and anointed and chosen people of God, more beautiful than any work of human hands, 
for you are the work of God. People of the book, fellow people of the book, I bring you greetings from your little brother. I have brought uh, 12 plus disciples with me and our mission today is of presence and of compassion. Presence to show you that we care and compassion from the Latin, which is to suffer together. We have heard of your deep and special pain at this hour and we cannot stand by and say nothing. We know you are experiencing excruciating loss. We know you are anxious, sleepless, and many of you are more disturbed than you've ever been in your entire lives. And we have come today because we are your friends, we are your neighbors, we are your brothers, we are your sisters, and we love you. We are here to listen, we are here to learn, we are here to share handshakes and smiles, and as people of faith, to look beyond ourselves. This is not a political visit, it is a religious one. It is not a visit of partisan division, but of spiritual unity. For this is the essence of the one we worship, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the one whose very substance and essence is love. And we will not make an idol out of political difference, of varied opinion, of polarized outlook. These things do not come first. God comes first. For there are to be no idols that come before God. It is love that must come first. And if we do not love our neighbor, how can we love God? Like your congregation, mine is not of one mind, of one opinion about the challenges that you are facing. We are divided, we are grieved, we are conflicted and deeply confused about what is happening and what will happen. We join you in looking to our Father, who is our mother, who calls us to have the faith of Abraham, to hope, to believe that nothing is too difficult for God. No Pharaoh is strong enough. No Red Sea is wide enough. No desert is barren enough. Our God has seen us through it all. Our God has not left the building. You have endured this and so much more good people of Sherzadik, and you have not left the building. Your faith is strong. Your compassion and humanity and humility is robust. The deep trouble in your soul is a byproduct of the deep love you have in your heart. I have sat in your pews and I've listened to your rabbi. I've heard him talk about compassion and justice and can only imagine the deep wrestling that goes on in your souls. So this we learn from you, big brother, that we do not put our trust in horse or chariot. We do not put our trust in sword or shield. We do not put our trust in human power. We trust in the Almighty One who creates planets and universes with words and with will and who promises to be with us through the valley of the shadow of death and beyond. We come to you to learn of faith in dark times. That's what you have by being here this morning. In awe and wonder of your poise amidst such grief, such suffering, such distress. We come to offer the encouragement that you have given us in our shared scriptures, words and theology that you have offered us, that God does not abandon or forsake, that God in deep mystery, in unknown silence, somehow remains God. We have come in solidarity to our shared witness that when the people of God stand rooted in faith, God can do miracles. And so about that 97%, we have so much in common, Rabbi Starr. One day each week, we face a congregation that has spent the last six days getting beaten up by a crazy world. We've spent six days bruised, brutalized by a world whose values and goals can often run in diametric opposition 
to ours. In our world, we can be denigrated and marginalized and victims of attempted robbery. As that big, bad world we share tries to take from us our convictions, our identities, our steadfast belief that God is present. But it is identity theft that has failed. It is a robbery that has been thwarted here among the people of God. In the holiness of God's presence, Rabbi engage in that holy work of remembrance. Here we bring to mind the holy stories, the holy truth, that six days of indoctrination in that crazy world cannot take from us. We remember the promise of our father Abraham, the first Hebrew, who gave it to you before it came to us, that we are to see a great nation, more numerous than the grains of sand on the beach or the innumerable stars in the sky, set apart and made special, not by anything we do, but by what God does. You have taught us not to be deceived. God wins our victories. God provides in the desert. God hears our cries of oppression. And when we cast our cares upon God, when we turn over our anxieties, when we turn them over to the one who cares for us carefully and dotes over us watchfully, when we let the Holy One steer the car, this is where the magic happens. I wonder how that's happening in your life this morning. I wonder how you and I are remembering that God who loves and cares. Friends, together, let us cling to these promises of provision, of protection, of presence. We cannot be joyful for everything, but as we look to our powerful God, we can find joy in everything. As Viktor Frankl learned in the death camps, you can take almost anything away from me, but never my ability to respond to what's around me. In the midst of Holocaust, God's wisdom shines, inspires, and endures to this day. How will you and I live into that wisdom to get us through? I wonder how many artists are in the house this morning. Then you may be familiar with the stories. Did we hear them earlier of Bezalel and Otholiab highlighted in today's Torah portion? To my friends, a Torah portion is translated in what we may call the Sunday readings. And for me, this Torah portion comes with its own coincidence. As you know, these two craftsmen are filled with God's spirit. They design and they craft the tabernacle, the furnishings, and the priestly garments. Bezalel and Atholiab are given the ability to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones, in setting and in carving wood. The coincidence here for me is in the profession of my parents, Jim and Nancy Yaw, who for 47 years owned an art gallery in downtown Birmingham. And they sold works by Jewish artists like Marvin Lepofsky and Shai Lahover. Not only were many artists Jewish, but also many customers, and more than a few from this congregation. And so I'd like to thank you for your patronage. You paid for my orthodontics and my school fees. <laughs> I tell you this story to reiterate our common journey, our common life. We're just down 12 miles from you. We are Jews and Christians for sure, but we're merchants and customers. We're neighbors, we're parents, we're doctors and nurses, we're teachers working side by side to redeem the same world. And we share so much in our hearts, 97%, perhaps nothing more than gratitude to God and one another for what we have. And this is the theme that I would like to finish on today. In your Passover meals, you've shared them with us in our space. I've shared them at your home. In your Sabbath worship, 
In your lives, I have seen at your core who you are and who God made you. Thankful, grateful. It is who you are and it is who you are called to be. It has gotten you through so much and will continue to be your secret weapon. Of course, on the journey you are facing, it is much too trite, much too uncaring for me to stand up here and just say, be thankful, look on the bright side. In this time and in this hour, we need more. At our church, in our faith, we are in this time of year called Lent. It is a 40-day period, and it leads us up to Holy Week and Easter. Every year, we like to set a theme. Many times, it's penitence, more devotion to scripture, to almsgiving, to prayer. But this year, given the darkness that surrounds our world, we decided to call our Lent the happiest Lent you've never had. And we are looking at joy and the strong themes of happiness that run through our shared scriptures. And we're looking at joy and happiness in religion and in science. And one particular researcher has done much investigation in how you and I get through very dark chapters of our lives, similar to what your community is going through now. And she invites us to look for something that she calls glimmers. These are small, shiny moments in which we can even briefly generate a smile or a nod. Think of that person who lets you cut in front of the line or when you get that last sale item at the supermarket or when you drive under an overpass in the rain like last night and enjoy even a few moments of silence in the storm. These are glimmers and they may produce a moment of joy in the midst of pain during this dark night of the soul. But they can also point us, my brothers and sisters, toward an end because another aspect of that 97% we share is this sense that somehow all of creation is headed toward God. There will be a time of accountability, of acceptance, and finally reunion with the divine. And knowing that respite is our destiny, albeit clothed in mystery, may just be a big enough glimmer to get us through. So as we take each other's hands, walking through the wilderness as dangerous, unpredictable, and scary as it is, we invite you to take our hands as well. We share our humanity. We share our trust in God and our divine, divine mandate to love our neighbor as ourselves. You do not walk alone. We journey together. Amen.